go ahead and turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Acts. We're continuing in our series uh, through the book of Acts. And last week we began part one, Jesus Messiah. Uh, this Sunday we will, uh, this morning we will um, finish part two. Uh, last week we looked at the person uh, the Messiah, and this week we will pick up where we left off in verse 25 of chapter 2. You know, this morning we'll look at the third part of Peter's sermon, his proclamation there at Pentecost. And by the way, it was a great example of New Testament preaching. It's a great example of preaching in general. When you look at the five elements of New Testament preaching, it presented Jesus as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. It described Jesus as God in human flesh. It focused on his life and his work especially his death and resurrection, and it spoke of his second coming. And can I tell you, he's coming back. And next week we'll begin our Christmas series, and we'll, we'll celebrate all of September for the first time that he came. But can I tell you, church, he's coming back, and I believe it's going to be sooner, certainly, than later. And so finally it declared the salvation that was only through faith in Christ Jesus was Peter's sermon here, and that those who rejected him as Lord and Savior would be eternally damned. And so this initial speech by Peter, if you will, is in, entirely about promise, fulfillment, and the resurrection and ascension. And so as Peter is preaching, he'll use many of the Psalms to share with them that the day that that day and with us today, that this is the key figure of the Old Testament prophecies was the Messiah. The Messiah is the one they long for and the one that they look for. Did y'all know that Jesus is the fulfillment of all prophecies about the Messiah? There's nobody else that fulfills those prophecies except for Jesus. Did you know there's over 300 prophecies, over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled in his life. Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies in his lifetime. And fulfill, listen, fulfilling just eight of those prophecies, if we did some math this morning, listen to me for a second. If we did some math, just to fulfill eight of prophecies, okay, would be like one in the one times 10 to the 17th power. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? I knew y'all did. Think about it. 10 to the 17th power just to fulfill eight of them. So let me give you an illustration that I heard one time that might give you, an, uh, give you a little bit more, more confidence so that you understand what I'm saying. Because I understand some of you are like me. You're struggling in math. I get you. More than 10 to the first power you struggle with. Because 10 is 10, right? So just listen to the illustration. You'll understand what I'm saying. So listen, if we took a silver dollar, everybody know what a silver dollar is. Just say, shake your amen. amen. All right. All right. Silver dollar. If we took silver dollars, laid them all across the state of Texas where there was not one inch of ground left. Think about it. What I'm saying, take a silver dollar, okay, lay them all out, stack them up, if you will, okay, over the state of Texas, two feet deep. Y'all got it? You following? Just nod. Silver dollars stacked two foot high, covering the whole state of Texas. Not, not one inch of ground left. Picture that now. Just, now just take one silver dollar and mark it. Just one out of those trillions. Of, okay, all right, Just think about what I'm saying here. Take one of them and mark them. You know where it's at, but nobody else knows where it's at. And you pick a gentleman, and you say, you can go all over Texas. You can go anywhere you want to, San Antonio, Dallas, Austin, wherever you want to go. The chance of him picking up that silver dollar. And Jesus didn't fulfill eight. He fulfilled over 300. Y'all understand what I'm saying? So if you're physically able, I'd ask you to stand with me as we read God's Word. What chance would that guy have to find that silver dollar? The same chance these prophets had writing these prophecies and having them all come true in one man. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 25. 
It said, for David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, and he is at my right hand. And can I tell you, he's at the Lord's right hand today, interceding for you and I right now. It says, for the, he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. That ought to give you confidence right there. Because Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father, we don't need to be shaken. No matter what's going on in the world, we need to have steady confidence. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection resurrection of the Christ and his soul was not left in Hades nor did his flesh see corruption this Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the father the promise of the Holy Spirit he poured out this which you now see and hear for David did not ascend to the heavens but he says himself the Lord said to my Lord sit at my right hand till I make your enemies, your footstool. Would you pray with me? Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, speak to our hearts. Lord, encourage us this day that, Lord, you are the Messiah. And, God, you are worthy of all of our praise. For we pray it in the sweet name, the holy name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Now, the takeaway is simply this, the same as last week. Jesus is the Messiah that God promised. And the first thing we see in this text is the divination, the divine nation. Listen, in verses 25 through 21, it, it, through 28, David is speaking here concerning the Lord. Now listen, after spending one verse on Jesus' life and one verse on Jesus' death, Peter spends now nine verses on his resurrection, or to tell you the resurrection is important, which is the main theme of the preaching in Acts. Now the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as is, is, is we, we, we know it, uh, is to all of us is the cornerstone of Christianity. It's mentioned at least, at least 104 times in the New Testament. And so it is without question the most profound and prominent point in biblical history and in all redemptive history. And so when you look at this, uh, the, for this purpose, selecting one to complete their number again to 12 after Judas had betrayed Christ and went off and, 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 and killed himself, uh, the, the selecting of the, the, the next disciple to replace Judas, it was so important. The statement was made that the chosen person had to be a witness of the resurrection. And so now to confirm the resurrection as God's plan for the Messiah, Peter very, very carefully takes an Old Testament text, Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11, and quotes it and then applies it. And it's a masterpiece. I love the way John MacArthur says it. He says, for David, of course, just, I mean, he's getting, the crowd is ready. They're listening. They're intently focused on him. And boom, he hits them with David. Now, they know David. David's important to these folks. They, they love David. And so he grabs them, literally, before they even can, can figure it out. See, they loved and adored David. And he's about to show them that the person that they loved and adored was trying to share with them and had shared with them that the Messiah was coming and, in fact, had came. This quotation from Psalm 16, uh, David is speaking of the Messiah. Did you know David sees the Lord on the cross in Psalm 22? And in Psalm 69, he sees him again on the cross, and he sees him risen and ascended in this particular psalm that Peter is referencing. See, the Old Testament saints must have been puzzled over the Psalm 16 with its references to death and preservation from corruption in the grave, because they were thinking, if you die, you're gonna, your body's going to decay. And yet this says, nope, it won't, not for the Messiah. I mean, how could the Holy One in the Psalms, the Beloved One, the Messiah, possibly die, and how could he possibly escape the inevitable corruption of the grave when he did die? 
So there's so many prophecies, so many things proclaimed in the Old Testament that point to Jesus. Psalm 16 was one of them and had a literal fulfillment. Did you know that in 1 Corinthians 15, it tells us that over 500 people saw the the risen Savior alive? Even in Isaiah, the thing you think about prophecies, Isaiah 52 and 13, behold, my servant shall, shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Uh, Matthew 12, even Jesus, but he answered and said to them in, in verse 39 of Matthew 12, this Jesus, an angel and adulterous generation seeks after a sign an, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three, that was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so these prophecies are just pointing to Jesus, so many in the Old Testament. And Peter's telling them, you've been waiting for the Messiah. You've been looking for him. You've been longing for him all the time he was here with you. In Matthew 22 and verses 41 through 46. It says, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Then they said to him, the son of David. And Christ said to them, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord? Saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. He used scripture, Christ did, to try to get them to understand, I am who I say I am. See, David wasn't talking about himself in this psalm that Peter is referencing. He was talking about Jesus, Messiah. See, if Jesus is not the Messiah, then there's not going to be one. If he was not the Messiah, then there's not going to be one. If Jesus doesn't fulfill all that the Old Testament prophecies show that he fulfilled, you and I are just wasting time this morning. The fact is we're not wasting time. Because he is who he says he is. We see the divination. Then we see the verification. The verification in verses 29 through 32. Uh, The Bible says, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you on the page of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. Uh, He was saying, Peter cites this psalm and shows an Old Testament prediction of the resurrection. In this psalm, David declares that God will not abandon his soul, uh, nor will he allow the Holy One to undergo decay. But Peter argues David is both dead and buried. And his tomb was right there in Jerusalem. In other words, David's body did not, David's body did undergo decay. Therefore, David as a prophet knew that God had promised to seat one of his descendants on his throne. And so he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. And Peter identifies Jesus as the Messiah. When he says, this God, listen, this Jesus God raised up again to which we all are witnesses. See, Peter knew that no one could dispute the point that he was about to make about David. No one would say, David's not dead. Everybody would know David's dead and buried and his, his, his bones are still there. And they could not dispute that. And Peter knew. He knew. And so he's speaking about someone else, David's heir. And all this has been answered at Calvary. Go with me there for a moment. See, the question is not if he was the Messiah. He's already proven he was. The Lord's proven in his word, in his prophecies, and finally in the person of Jesus Christ. Both in a living and dying way. Because he lived a sinless life, died a perfect death, vicarious death. He's the substitute for all of us. He is the sacrificial death, the sufficient death. And then he rose again from the dead, not only rising from the dead, but then showing himself alive to over 500 people in a 40-day period. And he didn't stop there. He sent the Holy Ghost of God that we looked at in Acts 1, and, and the Holy Spirit dwells in his people And so we see verification. He's pointing, God has verified it through his word and through his son. And he was standing 
and walking and talking with you all the time. He verified him. Not only do we see the verification, the last thing we see is an exaltation. The exaltation in verses 33 through 36. Look with me there. He says, therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God. That just blesses me every time I think about it. One, because I know what he's doing on the right hand of God. He's interceding. He still has us on his heart. Nothing changed when he ascended. He had mankind on his heart before the foundations of the world. He had mankind on his heart when he left the throne room of heaven. Entered into this world through a virgin womb. He had mankind. He had all of us on his mind. He had us on his mind when he walked through life. He had us on his mind when he went to Calvary. And he still has us on his mind today. Seated at the right hand. He goes on to say, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. See, the Bible tells us Jesus was exalted. See, they had seen him rise. They had seen him walk about over 500. And they had seen him ascend back to heaven on a cloud. Did you know in Hebrews chapter 1, the Bible tells us that he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And that, my friend, is a prominent place. Peter pointed out that this heir is Jesus who was put to death and resurrected. Not only had Jesus been raised from the dead, he is now at the right hand of the Father. As further proof of this, Peter quoted David again, according to Psalm 110 and 1, the Messiah would sit at the... You see, all these prophecies being fulfilled through one person, Christ The apostles declared themselves to be witnesses of the very ascension spoken of in this psalm, the ascension of Jesus. And based on these points, Peter's conclusion is very clear. He says, you've seen and now you hear. How tragic that many will have seen the goodness of God and the evidence of God. Just walk out the doors. And and they'll hear. The name Jesus. They'll hear the gospel of how he came and died to save. And they'll hear it and reject it. See, Jesus, the one who had been crucified, is both Lord and Christ. See, we talk about making Jesus Lord. We're too late. He already is Lord. He is Lord in the beginning. I believe in Colossians. It said that all things are made through him, in him, and by him, and for him. He's already Lord. We can't make him Lord. He's already Lord. Now, you can get in on it if you want to. But he's Lord. Nobody makes him Lord. He is Lord. He's Lord and Christ. He's the Messiah. He's risen from the dead. He's ascended and he is at the right hand of the Father. But he's not going to stay there forever. He's coming back. And the first time he come in grace, the second time he's coming in all of his glory. Are you ready? He's coming back again. See, the question this morning is simply this. Is Jesus your Messiah? Is he your Messiah? Is he your Savior? Is he your Lord? 
you know, without question, perhaps the most famous, well-known name outside of politics and entertainment would be Billy Graham. Of all the stories that I've ever heard about uh, Dr. Graham, probably my favorite is this one, at least one of them. Uh, He was going to a certain city to do one of his crusades. There were some critics who didn't particularly care for either his style or his method. And I would just have to question, what's wrong with his style or his method? His style was to preach God's gospel in a very compassionate yet convicted way. And he just stayed with the text. Chances are folks didn't like his style or his method because they didn't like his message. Y'all all right? So he was going to this city and they didn't want him to come. They called a press conference and said, if we let this man come to our city and preach his message, he'll set the church back 50 years. And y'all know the rest. Dr. Graham said, I ain't trying to set it back 50 years. I'm trying to set it back 2,000 years. So yes, that's where the church needs to get back to. See, in many ways, we become too modern in our gospel. Stripping away the crucified Savior for a type of Jesus who just couldn't handle that death. Can I tell you, he not only handled it, he conquered it. And he's alive and he's well interceding for each and every one of us this morning. Aren't you glad his love never fails, especially at Calvary? In just a moment, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. I'm thankful that he's Messiah. Lord of all. Well, thank you for tuning in and listening to this online message from Living Water Baptist Church. We hope you've been encouraged and challenged. We at Living Water believe that every time God's word is preached, it demands a response. Jesus reminds us in Matthew 7, 24, that everyone who hears his words and does them will be like a person who built their house on a solid foundation. So if there's a decision you know of that you need to make in response to this message, would you let us know by emailing us at decision at lwbctriad.org? Whether it's the need to repent of your sins and trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you need to follow through on your salvation and be baptized, or you want to join our faith family here at Living Water through church membership, or you simply need us to pray for you. Whatever the need, we want to hear from you. So please email us at decision at lwbctriad.org so that we can better minister to you. For more information about Living Water Baptist Church, be sure to visit us online. You can check out our website at www.lwbctriad.org or you can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash lwbctriad. Well, God bless you. Thanks again for joining us online, and we hope to see you in person this coming Sunday.